Hi and welcome to the second edition of Impact by Tribeca Brookman. Today we have with us Mr. Harsh Nehotia, who is a Padma Shri holder. He is also the winner of the YPO Legacy of Honor Award. He is the Honorary Con Council of Israel, past president of FIKI, chairman of Neotech Hub, chairman of CII SNCL, CEL, which is the Suresh Nehotia Center of Excellence for Leadership. He is a member of the Board of Governors for I Am Calcutta and also the co-owner of Atletico de, de Calcutta. Um, and the list keeps going on. I can go with um, his achievements for another minute, but we'll stop here and ask him uh, the toughest question of the interview, which is cricket or football? Cricket always. Okay. Uh, and I have a, certainly a small interest in the franchise of football that we have, but I think uh, Bollywood and cricket are such that probably any Indian uh, is necessarily interested in these. Um, I don't know if I told you this, but I've had a, a personal admiration for you for a really long time now. Um, and I've really enjoyed uh, reading through some of your interviews. But here's something that I personally want you to know as well. What dinner table conversation that is primarily about your childhood? What dinner table conversations about business common uh, at your house? What influenced you as a child? And what were the how what were the dynamics? So, so I childhood? grew up in a joint family. My father with three brothers. Father and uh, So I lived with my grandparents. I lived with aunts and uncles and of course my brothers and sister, my sisters. So uh, it was a it was a vibrant household uh, where everyone pursued different interests. I think all in the family were interested in a certain cultural and artistic aspects. So uh, whether it was music, art, history, philosophy, literature. I think uh, those were quite uh, significant influences in my childhood. We had a number of eminent uh, scholars and artists visiting our homes, some even staying over as house guests. So uh, those are the people we met and spent time with. Uh, we weren't particular, I mean, we were reasonable, but we weren't particularly affluent. So I didn't have a spoiled upbringing, uh, thankfully. I think uh, we enjoyed simple things. Uh, there was no problem in terms of day-to-day -day living, but uh, there was certainly no money to, s to spend beyond uh, a decent life and a decent education. I think uh, affluence came into our family only when I was in my uh, early 20s. So by that time, I was also a part of the business. So I think, uh, of course, uh, business was always uh, central to any discussion, at least with the men folk. But as much as it was business, it was also uh, a lot of talk on, on on human values, on culture, on art, on the history. I think uh, as a family, all members were involved in pursuing some interest. So I think uh, that was an important part of uh, the discourse. So throughout your school days, your college days, did you know that you were going to take up business uh, at some point and become a business person or were you interested in something else and you stumbled upon the business? Is that something like that? No, no, I think uh, I come from a family that probably had the seventh generation involved with business. So it was kind of, in those days, fairly natural that you would succeed your uh, parents in doing what they did. I mean, it was not really, uh, I don't think they would have objected if I wanted to do something else. But there was no such uh, specific, uh, strong desire if I was as well. And if there was a fleeting interest in, say, uh, a theater, or certain other pursuits that I was doing as a student, uh, it was uh, not, not, I wouldn't 
say it was a passion or something which was very strong. And it was kind of understood that uh, you would do business. So I think uh, subconsciously uh, one was uh, inclined to look at that as the future career. Uh, of course, it's very different to the bringing of my children who have been uh, not conditioned with any such expectations. So uh, they have been brought up with, uh, I think, a much more open and liberal approach. I'm not saying my parents were conservative, but uh, I don't think they really thought that anything else would possibly be of my interest anyway. Uh, they not? No, as I said, I, I, I didn't think of anything else seriously enough. I mean, frankly, uh, if I was brought up the way I brought up my children. Um, maybe, maybe I would think, but I think it, business happened naturally because uh, that's what was expected. So in, in the natural sense, did you have someone that you looked up to? It may not be a business figure, but a figure that you sort of wanted to emulate? So there were no icons of business that got me into business. I just went into it because everyone in the family was doing it, it was expected, I was the only son in my generation. Our business is not just business, just a hero that you had. Of course, I mean, uh, early in life I was uh, attracted to uh, wisdom literature of our land and uh, came in contact with uh, Swami Chinna and Swami Parthasati, uh, Swami Arakadamji. And I went to their discourses uh, with my grandfather who uh, encouraged me to listen to them. And that brought me to, uh, to be curious. Uh, of course, I remember that in those days uh, there were very few young people, unlike today when I see a lot of young people interested in, in understanding about our ancient wisdom. In those days, uh, it was uh, rare to find people my teenage kind of a state that I was in, uh, in present in any of these gatherings. And um, so I got interested in reading Vivekananda, Aurobindo, Tagore, Gandhi. And they became my heroes. Uh, so it was not business icons that, uh, of course, there were people that later on I read about and came in touch with about Warren Buffett. Steve Jobs and um, Bill Gates. Walt Disney was one of the great heroes in my life. Uh, of course, in India, there were many. So I think uh, it happened much later. So now you make the transition into business. What's it like? You've got a very uh, diverse background from your interests. Now you make an entry into the family business. What were some of the challenges that you faced? What was your thinking and what the end? You had certain expectations, I'm sure. When you entered the business, <laughs> did the realities match your expectations or was there a gap there? Well, I don't think I went in with any some set expectations. Uh, it, it was a series of coincidences, circumstances and accidents that led me to do one thing or the other. It was not like our family was in real estate. We had none of us in the family. I think the only thing they ever did was to build their own home in which we lived, but nothing else as far as building it uh, in terms of a dwelling house is concerned. They probably built a factory. So, um, when the first opportunity came to build a house, it just sort of was to learn something because it was not something that I had an organization or there were people in the family who could guide me because they knew something about it. So it was starting from scratch. I was 21 years old. I was still in college. Uh, I was doing Econ honors at Xavier's. Uh, we used to have classes till night, 40 in the morning, and then I would go home and have a big shower. In those days, traffic was minimal. So I would be in office by 11 o'clock. And um, I started working on the project. 
of course, uh, I got in touch with an architect, uh, one architect who had a very important role in creating my interest in design and architecture. It just coincidentally happened that his office was a few hundred yards away from my first project site. And uh, therefore, uh, and since the project site was uh, just 450 square yards, there was no space uh, to have a small office there. So I would actually spend a lot of time physically at my architect's office, who took a lot of time for me. And uh, he was uh, somebody who guided me. And I would, you know, those days you, you survived on Puri and tea, so I used to have a, lots of cups of tea and body with this architect, Mr. Ashok Naik. And he, uh, he gave me uh, a, a lot of good advice and guidance and I think that started my interest in, in exploring design and architecture. Later on, of course, I met many other eminent architects. Uh, Mr. Bhavishan Roshi in particular was a great influence, uh, Charles Korea, and Prabir Mitra in Calcutta is another great influence. So I met lots of such eminent people and many other people, both national and international. I got more and more interested even as I explored reading and visiting projects uh, in India and overseas. So, so far from your story, there's clearly an overarching theme of arts and literature that has an influence on you your business life. Tell us about your involvement with Ambuja Cement. What is, because that doesn't sound uh, like it's got a lot of art in it. Maybe art of business, but. So, uh, as I said, uh, Ambuja Cement and my story in real estate were two parallel tracks. I think it was in the year 1985, I was 20. I just finished my first small building that I mentioned. That's the time the plant was getting, the first plant of Abuja was getting uh, set up in Abuja. And my father and uncle were involved uh, along with my maternal uncle, Mr. Sengsaria, who was based in Bombay. So they were kind of developing that project and my father did indicate that I should take interest in it, but I was quite, by that time I had built this small building and I was quite happy build more such buildings. So they kind of said, okay, we are busy doing that, you can carry on building uh, houses. I'm sure they were a bit reluctant about it, but I don't think they insisted that I have to do that. So this is all that was going on, and I did one project and another. And I think there were maybe what 10, 12 projects I did in that period from 1984 to 1996. 12 years. In 96, the cement business had grown very big. And in 96, they started looking to expand their business in a aggressive manner. So they had bid to acquire the erstwhile Modi Cement Company, which was based in Chhattisgarh, and which was in what is now known as the in the bankruptcy court. So those days it was called the BIFR. And uh, it appeared that we were one of the front runners in the final bid process. So I was sort of summoned by my folks at home along with Mr. Sixeria and said that we've allowed you to do things that you wanted for these 12 years. Now this is the big business of the family and you better get involved with it. And uh, this is an opportunity uh, if, we, if we win this bid, would like you to take responsibility. So it seemed like a very daunting challenge. I was a little apprehensive, not exactly uh, excited. But uh, I was clearly mindful of one thing, that I was doing a business where the family's resources were very small in the real estate. And our bulk of our investment was in the cement business. So if I wanted to do something where probably use my skills at a bigger scale, I had to be involved with that. 
so after giving it a deep thought when we did win the bid finally which was in middle of 97 uh, i accepted to uh, take that responsibility i of course had hoped and my folks also agreed that i would be uh, they would be happy if i carried on to do my real estate development but little did I realize that it, that would be so time consuming and so uh, involving that I had to almost uh, give up a lot of the other activities that I was involved in. So from 97 to 2006, those nine years, almost 10 years, I was fully involved with the cement business. And since that was a sick company, it, was, uh, uh, it had lots of litigation, it had, uh, the, the plant was under lockout. Was, since it was not functioning, it was in a bad state of repair. There was a uh, uh, host of issues, like any uh, thing that would go wrong would have. And of uh, course, you had a restive worker force who had not been paid, and you had uh, litigations of all kinds all over the place. So uh, we walked into that minefield, and then I got sucked into it like you get sucked into a vortex because obviously the challenges were huge. So it became quite evident within a few months that uh, I would not be able to at least grow my real estate. So we mentally decided that uh, we would scale it down quite significantly. And, uh, and we divested some of the lands we had. We had a few partnerships, we had some joint ventures. So we surrendered the joint venture in favor of the joint venture partner told him to carry on doing that. So things like that. So we readjusted. And we didn't stop it. Thankfully, we had the company running, but it was scaled down and there was a small team and they were doing uh, quite the projects. Was it during that period, 1999, what you conferred the partnership in 1994, the social housing project? Yes, yes. So you weren't doing too badly in the real estate sector? No, so I wasn't. So, but um, uh, actually, the, the project that we uh, got that for primarily was started in 1993-94. So it had a large part of it was complete by 97 and then of course the tail end was still to be completed. So that happened in between which was a uh, very pleasant surprise. And uh, so that's how it went and then uh, in, in 2006, uh, the family decided to divest the stake. And uh, so by that time, I was deeply engrossed with that. I had almost brought my real estate business to a sort of a skeleton operation. Um, but when that event came, then obviously I had to resign my post there. I did in 31st of uh, January 2006 and uh, uh, restarted again on the real estate front. And then since then, uh, we met it again. Yeah. There's another parallel track which you've not spoken about, which is hospitality. You were not just in the, you were involved in real estate, but also hospitality. Tell a bit about your interests in hospitality, why you thought that was a good place to be in. Well, it started off more as a, something more, I don't know whether it was really a very calculated business call or it was just an interest in uh, exploring uh, how we could uh, enhance customer experience. I was already making buildings, I said, you know, if you were to provide hospitality there, how would it be? So actually we started with, when I was making an office building in Calcutta, on those of the road and we had some space we decided to create a complete club there and that was my first uh, foray into hospitality. It started off rather poorly and for a year or two it was a big disappointment <laughs> in terms of response that we got but gradually uh, I think it, it, uh, it picked up and then one thing led to another 
And then of course really the thrust in hospitality came post 2006 when I got back into uh, this part of the business uh, in a more focused sense I would say. Then I uh, thought that this would be an interesting area uh, in addition to real estate. So we diversified both into hospitality and healthcare. So in, in your journey that far, so far, you must have had people who worked for you who made a significant difference to the organization. Um, tell us a little more about what you look for in people that you work with and what the common thread between everyone who works at Amuja Nyotia is. What's the one or two qualities that you look for when you hire people? I don't know. I don't think um, I have any formula. At least I don't have one consciously. So how should one look at hiring? How I should don't a new manager look at hiring? Well, I mean, there are some simple things that we all do. We will try to understand what his experience is, what his uh, response is to uh, certain situations. For me, I think there is some intuitive uh, sense that I give to someone's emotional quotient. Uh, I feel that people who respond highly on that would be more suitable for us. I'm not saying that they are uh, necessarily the most efficient uh, worker. That's not the reason. Is that because you are that way? Maybe. Maybe. I mean, maybe I find that uh, at least hope that we are a uh, little more humane as an organization and therefore uh, this is an aspect that I think is important. As I said, it's not it's not consciously thoughtful. I haven't put down, sorted, you know, put a, a kind of a SWOT analysis on it. So I, I won't be able to answer it with uh, the clarity that uh, um, the management consultant would. But uh, intuitively, I think that's one thing. Of course, I think that most importantly, um, more than your ability is your integrity. Uh, I look for that. It's not that, that you find it every time. Because uh, you, can, you can deal with some inefficiency, but it's difficult to deal with uh, lack of integrity. That's what I have found. But it's not to say that sometimes uh, a different approach could also work very well from a business standpoint. But I also believe that um, to a great extent work is nothing but an extension of life. And it's nice to be able to work with people who you would be happy to spend time with rather than just uh, uh, just work for trying to earn something and then say, oh God, I can't suffer this guy. <laughs> uh, that's not really a nice thing to Um, so, um, did you have mentors along the way? Yeah, lots. I mean, uh, when I say mentors means it's not exactly like a guru shishya kind of a very typical thing that there is one guy I go to and sort of fall at his feet and ask for answers to all my problems. But yeah, you you had mentors as in spiritual guides uh, in terms of a lot of them in terms of their writings and some of them in flesh and blood also. Uh, How about within the company? Yeah, I mean all my colleagues have been great sons. Uh, pillars of strength, many of them have been, some of them when I was much younger were much senior to me and therefore they were like uh, a guide. Of course, now as I have aged, I think I'm a senior thing, so most people are younger to me, but uh, it was not so 15 years ago. Other than that, of course, you have uh, my parents have been a very huge influence. And 
then there are other people, as I said, architects and other people I have met. So influences have been many. I wouldn't really uh, say there's only one person in different aspects. I've been fortunate because being in a joint family, you had the opportunity to meet a lot of people. And many of them were very incredible people. Why is the company not public? It's a big company. Why is no company not public? Well, we were public when we were in cement. But after that, when we divested, uh, unfortunately, We've had two, three setbacks, so we haven't grown to a desired level. One setback happened soon after we embarked on this journey in 2006 called the Lehman Brothers crisis. It very uh, severely hurt the real estate industry. So we lost several years in that, and then we struggled back up. And the last few years you've had all these challenges of RERA and demonetization and GST and a host of regulatory issues including changes in environment norms, building maps, fire norms, many many projects as a consequence have got delayed or had to be re-figured out. So uh, all of this led to a much, much slower growth. You essentially go public when you need finances to spur your growth. You don't just go public for the right price. And we didn't think we had that kind of a, what should I call it, a pipeline that would need significant funding. So whatever funding we had ourselves, and we were able to raise some debt. Uh, appeared sufficient. Also, we didn't think that with the track record we had built, which was high on customer satisfaction, but not much to share in terms of profitability because of all these challenges, that uh, we would be able to get any attractive valuation. So we're waiting our time. It's not that uh, we are not interested, but at the right time. You spoke about the real estate sector specifically the last time. Let's talk about the next step. What do you think? Because overarching fundamentals, demand fundamentals in India are decent. At least the best in the world, if you think about it. So if you would know more about the supply side. What do you think about the real estate business in the next 10 years? Is it, good? Is it looking much better? So it may not be a very conventional answer, but the truth is that uh, when I, if you had asked me this question 10 years back, everything that I would have told you wouldn't have come true. So I realized from, because uh, whatever we planned didn't work. But you still plan. You, with probability. Well, you stop, you stop bothering too much about it now, at least. You may call it foolishness, I would call it wisdom, but uh, Anyway, that's a perspective. Uh, perspective. Uh, you know, how much can you really, you know, you're, you're talking in terms of lots of moving parts. And uh, so I think we plan about only a couple of things that we would like to be known as a, uh, as a developer who can be trusted. We would like to do uh, good work and we'd like to bring aesthetic and creative contribution to our projects. And then, in that order, we'd like to grow. So, aesthetics the, about growth. Yes, so aesthetics, quality, promise to the customer ahead of growth. So, if growth is far behind, the focus is obviously on the other issues. And then, whatever growth happens, will be a consequence of getting those other pieces right. Where uh, I am not very excited is that you know you plan the growth and then you land up sacrificing on any of the other parameters. Because then uh, you know you are doing a lot of things but 
not necessarily doing them the way they should happen. So maybe we will not be amongst the fastest or most profitable companies in terms of uh, numbers, but we hope to be known for quality and trust. And I think that's where we would like to focus. Maybe it's not the most sexy way of looking at business, but um, and maybe things will be different when I'm not fully in charge and my colleagues and others take charge. But uh, so long as I think I would like to steer the ship, that's the priority I would like to do. She talked about succession plan. Is that no, something? If, if uh, I don't know. I mean, of course, everything. Is, is that one, one thing is sure, like you're not going to be around forever. And the other thing which is also sure, that you don't know for how long you're going to be around. So you know that uh, inevitably something else will happen. And it should happen. I don't know whether I have the luxury to plan that or it will happen all of a sudden. I don't know. I mean, you can only plan that when you know that you are having a limited time. I suppose when I am 57, it's not, I'm not uh, in that stage to plan it now. So when that time comes, but supposing something happens earlier, then you just let it happen as it will happen. How it personally is, is that the motto you live with most of the Excuse me. Personal life. Yeah. Um, the yeah, next 10 years. No idea. I, why should you have an idea? Let's put it this way. Even if you look back and if you are honest to yourself, I really don't think whatever you thought 10 years ago has happened. That's true. And this is true for every single person. And yet every single person is obsessed about a 10 year plan. So I said, listen, we must learn from our own history. Don't forget whether you agree with someone else's. Even your own truth will tell you that this is not something very important to do. You do what you can do. You make the best of what you should do. It's good to live in the moment because two things are very important. If you live too much in the past, you dwell too much in a period which cannot change. It's over, it's done with. Like it or lump it, there would have been good things and there would have been not so good things. If you gloat over the good things, it's not going to make a difference to your today. If you cry over the poor decisions, it's not going to help you. Tomorrow is uncertain. We don't know if it will come. And if it comes with what kind of form and in what kind of circumstances, we have no, we have no clue. If you dwell too much in the world of the future, you can keep worrying. You can worry endlessly about all sorts of things that will happen. World war, water scarcity, climate change, God knows what not. And closer home, even to yourself, your health, your family, it's too much to like, burden yourself with. Live as you would like to for the moment. For something that looks to be a near future, which itself is uncertain, but still. And work on that. That's the only way to make it, in my mind, productive and less stressful. So we've talked about the past your views on what you think about planning for the future. Let's talk about the present. And I know there's quite a few projects, both in the real estate side and the hospitality side that you're working on. Tell us a little more about what's what's in the pipeline in the near future. Very boring, I think, for your listeners to list out projects, but uh, essentially we are building malls, we are building offices, we are building houses. Building townships in Siliguri, in in Calcutta. So, this is on the real estate side. On the hospitality side, we are building three or four hotels at the moment. We have a few more sites. 
mostly resorts, but a couple of city hotels as well. We are building some restaurants, uh, taking a franchise of an American chain called Puno. So we're doing that. I think the audience definitely will be interested in something like that. Well, then we are in healthcare, so we have three running hospitals. We hope to add some more there. And then we have recently set up this incubation center for New Tech Hub, where, which is very young, with just about two years old. So we have a cohort of about 25 uh, incubators. We hope this year that like two or three of them will go for first round funding. So that is what it is. I'm going to jump ship a little bit and talk about the Suresh Niyotia Center for Leadership. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that is? Um, so CIA how has does a, someone get into it? CIA um, actually has this model where they invite corporates to partner with them in setting up these centers of excellence. I think they have seven or eight of them in India. In different, in different cities, they have something with the good bridge group in, uh, in Bangalore. They have something There's something with the Thapars in North India, there's something with ITC also. So like that. So they approached uh, us also and for, for being part of the uh, Central Excellence in Calcutta. So at that time my uncle, Mr. Suresh Nyotia, had just uh, taken retirement from his, uh, it was his uh, 17th birthday, he just retired from the business. And uh, I thought it would be uh, a good tribute to his uh, legacy, uh, Everett businessman, in the center. In his name. And uh, each center of excellence of CI is dedicated to a particular subject. So this one is on leadership. There's another one on sustainability. There's another one on manufacturing excellence. There's another one on climate change, etc. Et so that's what it is. Uh, as a donor, I become the chairman of that center, but it is run by CIA. I have no operating ceremonial <coughs> uh, to attend some functions and uh, that's it. So now we'll get to the meat of it. When we talk about the elections, uh, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, how does that affect business? How does that affect the young person? And does it really, do elections affect young people? Of course, it, 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 it's not about young or old. It, 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 should, should a young person be worried about, no, be no, interested in politics or know what's going on in politics? Is that it's a stuff? festival of democracy to be celebrated, not to be worried. You get an opportunity to express your views, you get an opportunity to hear the views of different political parties, and take an informed decision on which way you think uh, you would like to see your country govern. That's it. I mean, we make it out more than that. I mean, uh, I think it's, uh, you have chosen democracy as your uh, preferred way or the best way to govern yourself. You must know that the uh, popular opinion will decide the fate. So no matter what you feel, at the end of the day, uh, if more people feel like you, you'll get a government uh, that, is, that respects the way you think. And if you are in the minority, then you'll obviously get a government that is different than the way you think. But at the same time, I think political parties do have a very shrill rhetoric during this period. But uh, finally, when they come to governance, they, they are, in, or they should be at least, and I think they are in large cases uh, accommodating to even the differing viewpoints to some extent. And that's the only civil way of looking at it. And how about business? So they talk a lot about politics. So when you read papers, there is, there's a lot of coverage on how politics is affecting business. Does it truly affect business as much as? Uh, if, does it reflect the coverage, the, the effects on business, or are those so independent? Think, uh, no, it's not exactly independent. I think uh, increasingly politics and economy are somewhat getting reforced because the larger momentum of force multiplier in, in, in 
business is the market forces and the relative competitiveness of your country over other countries. But certainly politics has an important role. For instance, uh, how you engage with other countries is a very, very important part of uh, your being part of the international trade and international uh, ecosystem. And no country today is isolated in a globalized world, which is, of course, now slightly going back on that, but nevertheless, it is still a very interconnected world. Then there are policy measures that happen within the country, and therefore, uh, that will impact the way businesses are done. So I think it does, but uh, in a country like ours, uh, social issues overpower the political discourse because much fewer people are engaged with business than in so many other pursuits like agriculture. Uh, there's a lot of people who require support and relief because they cannot uh, make their clothes meet. They're not educated, they don't have enough uh, schools and hospitals to take care of all our people. So, I think the challenges are huge. I mean, uh, frankly speaking, as someone who at least likes to read and you know, be engaged in understanding the public space, uh, I think the politician's uh, role is very, very tough. We often uh, ridicule and try them, and, and I'm sure that in any profession there will be some bad apples, but I think for those who are in this, they really have a tough life because they really have to find solutions, very, very tough solutions, uh, in very, very tough circumstances. Who's going to I have no idea. Your favorite book, talked about reading, I know you read a lot. Uh, a book that you would recommend people read on business and your favorite book as well. No, no, so this, like, I read 2,000 books and it's very difficult to know. So you can pick five, it's okay, so you don't have to pick one. Uh, so it's not going to be easy. I mean, really, uh, it's going to sound very cliche, but uh, one of the all-time favorites will have to be the Bhagavad Gita. Okay. Uh, and that would, I think, by far score with most people uh, who have read it. Uh, and I have not read this text in Sanskrit because I can't read the language, but I read the translations. And I read multiple translations by various people, so uh, I, have a, I have a reasonable sense of uh, the various interpretations that are there. But it is very, very rich, and obviously, as I read various interpretations, it's not finite. You can interpret it in many ways. Yes, in many ways. But there is a popular interpretation, and then there are stretch interpretations. Uh, on a novel, one of my favorite books, which I read a couple of times, is Ayn Rand's Fountain Head. I think also because it deals with the life of an architect. And Um, there are many, many biographies. I think uh, one of the books that initially was very, very helpful to me was reading uh, the writings of Swami Vivekananda uh, from his complete works. I think he spoke in a language that was easy to understand. And I think he decoded uh, the lofty ideals of uh, Vedic thought and Vedanta. That was really, uh, I, I would recommend that to every young person to, uh, to get clarity of many, many issues. Right. Thank you, Mr. Nyota. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your time.